Uh, welcome, everyone, uh, to today's physics colloquium. Uh, it's going to be given today by our own uh, Murray Holland. Uh, I will sort of, uh, you know, Murray's been around here, uh, and so you think you know him. <laughs> Uh, but I will just remind you uh, of a little bit of Murray's history. Uh, Murray actually did his undergraduate uh, work at the University of Auckland, as well as a master's degree, I think, in physics and math, around 88, 90. Don't age me. Yeah, OK. <laughs> no more dates in this introduction. OK, I've already given enough dates that you can figure it out. Uh, he then went on a, um, he worked there with Dan Walls, who, if you don't know, he's sort of a pioneer of quantum optics uh, theory uh, there. Uh, and then uh, he went on a Rutherford Scholarship uh, from uh, University of Auckland to Oxford, uh, where he did his PhD working with what is now Sir Keith Burnett, I believe. He is a knight. Um, he was a Jilla Fellow uh, just before moving uh, to Oxford and uh, Murray doing his PhD with him. Uh, and actually, um, there's a very, very well-known work that came out of that, thinking about how to do something called Heisenberg Limited uh, Spectroscopy spectroscopy using these things called um, sort of uh, sort of number states or, or the, named after a guy named Dickey is how I would refer to them. Um, and um, uh, actually was very pioneering work. When he finished, he actually came right here to Jilla and started working as a postdoc with Peter Zoller. Uh, and uh, worked for a couple of years with Peter and then was hired uh, right into the physics department um, with that. And then since then has done work in the field of quantum optics uh, some of the sort of early theory, thinking about BEC, BCS crossover physics in collaboration with uh, Debbie Jen's experiments uh, in that field. Um, and then, uh, you know, recently has done work associated with proposing uh, novel types of lasers, novel types of self-organization physics. And today, uh, he's going to tell us about uh, this experiment that he's been working with on as a, as an exper as a theorist. Uh, but with, I feel like there's some grease under his fingers there. Now, that may not surprise you. Uh, if you ever have a chance to have a, a beer with Murray, he can sort of regale you with his stories of, of gliding uh, around the country. Uh, he, he sort of is this avid glider. And he goes up to, what was your record? Oh, How high have you been? Uh, 32,000 feet. 32,000 feet. Uh, but how long is this going to go on for? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and, and so, uh, actually, uh, if I were going to fly with someone, I would fly with me. Uh, he's one of the few people I would trust to pilot me around. So with that, let's give a warm welcome to Murray. Uh, I'll take it. OK, well, thanks very much, James. Um, I thought of giving a talk here on two level atoms, especially for Tom. But I uh, decided, no, I'm just going to do one level atoms, So just to make it easy. So that's what the talk's on. Um, this is a uh, uh, recent, a lot of the stuff I'm going to talk about is experimental data and it's extremely recent, some of it's uh, hot off the press. Um, I'm going to start a little bit by telling you about uh, the motivation for this and what we're trying to do uh, in this project. And uh, it's connect you'll see that it's connected with a, a big team of people. Um, so let me just start by just mentioning that here at CU, there are a lot of people involved in this stuff that I'm going to, going to show you. Um, this is kind of the team here. Um, it's funded from many sources. A lot of the funding has come from NSF via, via, via various places. Uh, Quantum 2 grants that came from the National Quantum In Initiative, from the Physics Frontier Center, uh, and from QSENT. So these are all part of uh, funding this. Uh, we've also had um, significant funding from the company uh, called Quanta, which is now in flexion. Um, and I would say it's also a um, very good example of the Qubit Quantum Initiative here on campus. We have connections with uh, aerospace engineering with um, professors uh, Penny Axelrad and Dan Shears and studio uh, and Sergio, who's their student. Um, from electrical and computer engineering, uh, Marco Nakotra and his student Jay. And here from physics and Jilla, there is a, a, a variety of people involved. Um, so Dana and myself, I've highlighted Katie and Kendall because they're basically the ones that I have done all the work that I'm going to just tell you about later. So uh, if, it's, if it's good, uh, you can congratulate me. And if it's bad, blame them. Um, so and Lillian uh, has also, she's, these other uh, people here are, are students who have been in my group. And they've all contributed to this project. So it's, it's not just me. I uh, just want to emphasize that. We've also got undergrads who have done, been working on this and doing honors theses and things like that. Um, so just to give you a context and just a sort of a uh, 
lay out the landscape of the numbers that are kind of relevant. Uh, what we're going to be talking about is a project that is supported by NASA with the aim of eventually flying this in space, okay, and looking at planet Earth, and looking in particular at mass changes in planet Earth uh, from space in a satellite. So just to give you an idea of what measuring gravity is all about, uh, this is a picture from the Grace and Gochi um, missions. I'll show you this, what they look like in a minute. But it's basically a map of the uh, gravity anomaly on Earth. Um, and so uh, the scale for this um, down here, uh, you've got here milligal. A milligal is about the same as a micro G. So we're talking here about things that change in the last, say, four digits of the 9.8. So gravity on Earth is about 9.8 meters per second squared, but it's not a constant and it varies all over the globe. From the equator to the pole, it goes from about 9.78 to 9.832. So it varies just due to the fact that planet Earth is not a sphere. Um, and so there are a lot of um, uh, modifications due to the inhomogeneities on the Earth and the fact that it's not perfectly spheroidal. Um, and you can sort of see the principal contributions to that here, which come uh, uh, in uh, at the sort of 100 micro uh, G at the Earth's surface. So that's a small number. It's also a big number. You'll see what I mean by that uh, in a minute. Uh, these Grace and Gochi contributions are just wonderful, uh, purely classical uh, measurement devices. Uh, the Grace, there's a Grace, Grace follow-on, which this image is from, Grace C, which is, uh, 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 which is another follow-on mission. Uh, and the, uh, so what the, basically what they do is they fly around a pair of satellites that are some distance apart, and then they monitor with GPS exactly how the length contracts and expands. And using that and reference to stars, they can map out exactly what the gravity field looks like. And the Grace gra gradiometer is more like two conventional accelerometers that are some distance apart, and you can use that to measure, for example, the gravity gradients. So these maps are made with these kinds of really wonderful classical measurement devices. Um, but you can sort of go beyond that and start to think, well, not just this like first order correction to the gravity around the Earth, um, but there are also variations, and the variations occur also in time. So, and that's what particularly what we are, we are uh, interested in. The largest time variations are due to sort of planetary perturbations and solid tides. So, as you know, that there's tides in the sea and so on, but there's also tides in the Earth and tides in the land, and they can be also measured. Um, so this gravity anomaly here is in microgal, and this is definitely not SI unit, but um, a microgal is, is uh, so th these numbers here are getting down into the, um, uh, uh, let me just make sure I get this right, microgal is into the, t yeah, this is in the 10 to the minus 8 kind of regions. Um, and uh, these, this top one here is due to the uh, ocean tides, which are known to, known to a large extent from radio altimetry and in situ measurements. And then there are um, the bottom right here, which are all the non-tidal atmospheric and oceanic variations. And we're going down here by another order of magnitude. So there are a lot of things that happen to the gravity on Earth as a function of time, just due to the, for example, uh, the inf influence with the moon and uh, other, other effects. And what's really interesting at this current day and age is even like lower, uh, measure, more accurate measurements of gravity than that. Um, so this is sort of in the single microgal. So we're talking about sort of 10 to the minus 9G. And these are the relevant numbers that NASA and the projects that are going on in JPL and also in the European Space Agen Agency are thinking about at the moment. Um, and these are variations due to all sorts of effects including things like a hydrological, so movement of water and planet Earth, which is really interesting, uh, ice sheet variations and so on, and all the errors in the modeling of tides and the, on, and the motion of the, the Earth's crust and so on. Um, so that's kind of the motivation. That's where this comes from, from a top-down approach, the big picture approach. Um, and so these slides are, um, are credited to uh, the PI of this larger group project, Srinivas Petapur, and um, we have just started a, uh, a, uh, an institute called the um, Quantum Pathways Institute, which is supported by NASA, and it involves a number of different universities, including uh, here at um, CU. Um, it basically brings together people with a variety of expertise to try to develop a quantum sensor that can kind of, sort of answer these technological questions for the next generation of sensing devices in space. Um, so we have our peers, CU and, and, and um, CU Boulder, but uh, we're also collaborating here with UC Santa Barbara, 
um, and in particular uh, on integrated photonic devices, so trying to make the lasers, the light that we need to do this kind of thing, really small. Uh, also uh, Texas, which is where Srinivas is from, which is the um, space center down there um, that is associated with uh, the systems integration, and uh, uh, as well as Caltech and NIST uh, are also partners in this. So it's quite a large project. Um, we have a grant of about $15 million to start this project, and we'll see uh, how far we get along in, say, the first five years of it. Um, the motivation that, uh, for the project itself, the things I'm going to talk to you about in terms of science, um, it actually, I would say, can be thought of as a connection with the well-known, which everybody here, of course, knows about the, the famous sort of atomic clocks that we have. This is kind of a center for the best clocks uh, in the world, I would say. Um, and the same ideas that went into sort of pushing the generation of clocks to where we are today uh, can be thought of in terms of this uh, initial sensing problem. So just to give you an idea, this is a picture of the NIST F1 uh, fountain clock. So this is kind of how time is measured. Um, you have like a beam, uh, 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 some atoms which you can push up in a fountain. They can go through uh, a microwave cavity and come back and go through the microwave cavity again and do something called Ramsey spectroscopy, which kind of allows us to read out an oscillation between two, a, a, a microwave transition and cesium. So the combination of this and the hydrogen maze is kind of how clocks are built. Um, and as you know, um, th the forefront of the clock business has been pushed back orders of, orders of magnitude by people like Jun Yi here at Jilla and others around the world. And one of the things they've done is to not only change the atom and go from cesium, which was the time standard, uh, to uh, uh, optical transition in strontium. Um, and that gives you a huge gain in the quality factor of the oscillator. Um, but they've also taken these atoms, um, strontium-87 is a fermion, and you can put them into a three-dimensional lattice. You make a sort of a crystal of these atoms. Um, and you can get a whole lot of them like this, and you can make a clock that's based on this uh, neutral uh, atom lattice. And that can push the frontier for time uh, by orders of magnitude, and that's what's happened. So the cesium clock, it, this is uh, the sensitivity in a logarithmic scale here as a function of the averaging time, also in a logarithmic scale. And statistical averaging always gives you like square root of the n behavior. So these things always have the same gradient, and that gradient is a half. But where it lies in the vertical axis is how, how sensitive the clock actually is. And the cesium clock is way up here at the top. Um, and so going from this microwave transition to an optical transition um, basically lead, led to a huge gain here. Uh, this was, for example, done in Dave Weinland's group at NIST and so on. Um, but going to these like optical lattices has really pushed down the sensitivity and um, improved the world's timekeeping by this like, factor of a million or so. So it's now down something like 18 digits. It's an amazing story. It's, a, it's an, in, an incredible uh, frontier topic in physics as a whole. Um, why do we do, use lattices with these atoms? There's a lot of reasons. Um, these uh, lattices allow you to confine the atoms. They can be stored there for long times and interrogated for very long times, which allows you to make very accurate frequency measurements. So it gives you long signal integration and long coherence times. Um, you can make it so that the, the, the atoms um, dephase on a very, very slow scale. You can also kind of get rid of a lot of the interaction effects by insulator states. Because these, these things are fermions, you can make sure that they don't, uh, that they form an ordered array where the uh, collisional interactions are greatly suppressed. And these kinds of um, topics here that are in red are the motivating factors for us thinking about uh, this as a platform for this kinds of inertial sensing. So let me uh, first tell you a little bit about how it is that you can measure gravity or you can do inertial sensing with atoms. Um, it's a topic which goes back to the early part of the 20th century because it's really foundational for quantum. I mean, just understanding the de Broglie wavelength and so on, the matter wave equation is really what gave the birth of quantum mechanics. And this uses those really basic features. Um, the simplest kind of atom interferometer, you would take a collimated atom beam, for example, out of an oven, and then you'd have these atoms, you would uh, interact with them with a pulse of laser light, and the, the photons, for example, if they're coming from the bottom to the top here, the atoms, uh, could, it could be arranged that the pulse is just right, so that they have a 50-50 shot of absorbing a photon or not absorbing a photon. And what happens is, quantum mechanically, is that they do both. So each atom will go along a superposition of taking the top path or the bottom path. 
And then you can shine on another light field, uh, actually for twice the time it turns out, and that creates a mirror which reflects these uh, atoms back. Uh, of course they split because of the momentum of a single photon here. Like if they absorb a photon they get deflected upwards and if they don't they carry on. Uh, this is exactly the opposite effect, it switches the roles of those two recoils. And it causes the paths of these two parts of the superposition to come back together and then they can be interacted with another pulse of light which is the recombiner and that's what you need to create interference fringes. And then you can look and see whether the atoms come out of this port or this port. So this is an atom interferometer and it measures something. It measures the acceleration of this apparatus or also equivalently the gravity field that could be in, in this uh, screen from say top to bottom. The atoms which go uh, up here would go a little bit slower than the atoms that go down the bottom and so they would pick up a little bit of a differential phase and you see that phase when you look at the fringes at the end whether they come out on the top port or the bottom port. Okay, so that's a conventional atom interferometer. It's actually very similar to an optical interferometer which has an even longer history. So for example you might make a Michelson or Mark Zender interferometer in the same kind of way by uh, shining a laser on a, on a mirror and having it split into two pieces and coming back and then put it in this half silvered mirror and look at the interference fringes or the, the pattern. Um, the Bragg interferometer looks very similar but it replaces the uh, matter pieces with light and the light pieces with matter. So it just basically changes the roles of these two things. Now what we would like to do here is to use this kind of like precision optical lattice stuff that I talked about for the clocks to do something similar. We'd like to build these devices that you need for interferometry of beam splitters, mirrors and beam splitters and so on and we'd like to do it with atoms in an optical lattice. Uh, so what does that mean? It means that we would like to find a way of putting atoms in a lattice and having them undergo a beam splitting operation where they go left and right, a mirror operation where they come back together and then a recombiner where we look and create the interference fringes. So this is, a, uh, this is possible but I think it's also not obvious and um, I'm not going to do a sort of a history review on this topic at all and for the sake of time because I want to show you a lot of pretty pictures which we'll get to. Um, but I'm just going to say um, there are a number of important um, uh, aspects that, that people looked at in terms of creating the, um, the foundation for this, this topic. Um, in particular there was an early paper by Pierre Maestra who probably a lot of you know actually. He's been to Jilla here many, many times and his uh, colleagues on momentum state engineering in an optical lattice. Um, also some of you probably remember Carrie Widener who was here and did her PhD uh, in sort of the 2015-2018 range along with Ronnie Kozloff who's been a visiting fellow here a few times and Dana Anderson who's here in the audience um, and they developed the shaken lattice interferometry experiment which basically put the atoms into an optical lattice in the lower states of the lattice and use kind of uh, control methods to try to create these uh, beam splitters and mirrors and so on in a closed loop um, experiment. Um, more, more recently we've had these uh, NSF projects that I told you about uh, in particular uh, Katie Ledisma, Kendall Meerling and Lillian Chi who's a theorist in my group have contributed a lot to sort of a, a different way of doing this. Instead of this shaken lattice interferometry in the bottom uh, ground state of the lattice we are putting the atoms up from the valence band where they're locked into the conduction band just above the surface of the lattice we have something which is sort of a hybrid between this shaken lattice idea and the free space Bragg interferometer where they can basically have energy to move large distances across the optical lattice and then we can reflect them and bring them back together and put them back into the valence band and study them. So that's um, a little bit of the history. So how do you go about doing, um, doing uh, uh, mirrors and beam splitters with atoms and lattices? It's not obvious that you can do it at all, um, uh, but you can. And one of the ways that we've got of finding these solutions is uh, reinforcement learning, which is a kind of machine learning actually. Um, if you uh, are familiar with um, the DeepMind project for example, there are uh, AI algorithms now which can solve for example the game of chess, you know, way, way better than humans can. Like they'll beat the world champion every time now, every time. Uh, they have ratings of 3,600 or something and the world champion's like 2,800 and means that they just lose, okay. And how do they do this? Well they play a game with themselves, you know, they can actually learn by just playing gazillions of games and it's based on uh, what's called reinforcement learning, various variants of this. 
Um, there are other examples as well. AlphaGo, for example, is, is also another famous um, a game that's been solved in this way. Uh, AlphaFold is, is for protein folding. Uh, there are more examples of this. They also use this to control helicopters and robots. They make robots walk. Okay. So it's, it's, it's a big, a big uh, topic in AI. Um, if you study uh, computer science and machine learning, you'll definitely cover this. And basically, it's a learning cycle where you've got some uh, agent in here, which is kind of the brain, and decides on, like, what action do I want to play? Like, do I want to move the pawn forward two squares, or what do I want to do? Uh, in our case, wants to, we want to move the lattice. We're going we're gonna to translate the lattice left or right. Um, and then uh, uh, there's going to be an environment, which is the... The, the actual experiment, if you like, or the model on the computer which carries out that action. And then based on the result of that action, you're going to make an observation and, and see where you are. And that's kind of like looking at the chessboard and seeing how, you, how the game is going. And the idea is basically to take this environment and this agent and find a goal that maximizes the long-term rewards. I just want to mention that this is really different to optimization usually, because in, in, usually in optimization problems we are trying to find a pathway to descend into a, a deep minimum or something like this, right? And, and if you think about chess, it's not like that. You might like sacrifice the queen, sacrifice the bishop, sacrifice the rook, sacrifice the rook. You might end up with a king and a pawn and you just mate the opponent and you're done, right? You win the game and that's all you care about, right? Well, actually that probably would never happen, but you get the idea. Um, so the aim is only, only realized at the end, the long-term rewards. And that's similar to quantum design. You want to move the lattice around in some way such that you achieve a target. That target might be a target unitary for quantum computation. It might be a target state for uh, quantum metrology or measurement science or, or whatever. And so that's basically what we're doing. We're playing chess, but we're playing chess with quantum systems. And we're achieving goals which are written down in terms of quantum measures like fidelity and Fisher information and things like this. We use two methods, basically. Um, one is our neural network which controls our, our, our system, our optical lattice, uh, and tries to achieve a target. This is a target which, for example, would be a beam splitter. It's actually a high momentum beam splitter. The atoms are going left and right with uh, four h bar k. h bar k is the momentum of a single photon. So this would be like eight h bar k splitting. And we ask the computer, see, can you find uh, a sequence of, of these motions that achieve this state when you start with a Bose-Einstein condensate? And it comes up with an answer. Um, we can also use another kind of control protocol, which is what I said, we collaborate with electrical engineering. They do this kind of work all the time. This is a quantum optimal control. It's, it's a kind of different approach, uh, which is model dependent. So they write down a model, they use a Newton step, where they take the gradient of some surface and they make a quadratic approximation to it, and they use a projection operator to iterate back and forward to find a control function which controls a Hamiltonian in a given way. So this is a, 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 um, an algorithm. And um, what I'm going to show you here is that these kinds of approaches both work in the lab, and they both work with extremely high fidelity, and they produce solutions. Uh, there's a whole family of solutions to these kinds of problems, all of which have absolutely no human intuitive character to them whatsoever. You know, the computer just comes up with an answer. Um, this, for example, is a beam splitter. This is the motion of a lattice going back and forward, sl sliding back and forward. If you put a Bose-Einstein condensate in it, half the atoms go this way, half the atoms go this way. Uh, this is also a beam splitter doing something really crazy and, and zapping and so on. Also works, okay? And there are many other solutions. Every time we search for solutions, we'll find different answers. Um, okay, uh, so I said I would show you pretty pictures. Let's start. Um, this is a, um, a MOT of rubidium-87 atoms. Um, it, this is uh, built on a, a, a double-cell a cold quanta um, system, sitting inside a little science. Uh, well, this is the top uh, uh, of those two chambers. You're looking at about a billion um, rubidium-87 atoms. They, they do glow. You can see them with your eye. 780 nanometers is is just within the visible range. Actually, some people can see them, I would say, is more accurate. They look a bit like a ghostly cloud if you turn the lights out, so you can see these atoms. Uh, they're about 300 microkelvin and about a billion atoms. Um, then what you do is you take these uh, billion atoms, you squish them in a compressed mod, and you cool them more with polarization gradient cooling. And so these are standard uh, laser cooling tricks, okay? These are tools of the trade. 
uh, which cools it down to maybe 20 microkelvin. Um, and then they, at that point, they're cold and dense enough that you can load them into what is basically a pair of optical tweezers. You can basically shine laser light, focus laser light that crosses in the middle of the atoms. And uh, the light attracts the atoms, and where they cross creates a little potential well, a little obloid trap, a little blip that's associated with the light intensity that can, can capture um, a few million of these atoms. And then you can slowly turn down the lasers that make this little pair of optical tweezers. And as you do, the atoms are colliding, they're rethermalizing, and it's kind of like, I'm sure you've heard this, the coffee cup analogy, where you've got like a hot liquid and then the hottest coffee atoms run away and the rest get colder. Same thing happens here. As you, as you lower the intensity, you boil off the hot, hottest atoms, they cool down, they become colder, they become denser, and so on. Um, so this is an all optical BEC experiment. There's no RF evaporation here, for those of you who know what I mean. Um, and as you do this, as you cool them down like this, they become colder and denser, colder and denser, colder and denser. And then it's absolutely required that you make three images, and I blame Eric for that, um, of a thermal cloud uh, background with a little spike and a, and a spike. Okay, so now we have uh, BEC. About, um, the temperature here is about 20 nanokelvin. Um, and you can make Bose-Einstein condensates of up to about 200,000 atoms. And you can do it in the scale of a few seconds, five, 10 seconds, maybe a little more, uh, in that sort of scale. Um, you could push that further. Um, but you know, in other words, that's the kind of repetition, that, or that's the kind of time scale that it takes to do this. Most of the things that we do uh, on the interferometry side maybe use sort of 30 to 50,000 condensate atoms. So. Um, this is just some picture of um, the original 1D lattice experiment going back about one year. Um, I'll give you a little schematic here. You can't really see, in the middle is this little cell. It's completely evacuated. I mean, these things are um, just above absolute zero, so obviously they have to be thermally isolated from the room temperature around, and you do that by just sucking all the air out. There's an incredibly high vacuum here in the middle of this chamber. It's about maybe an inch on each side. Um, and this original experiment was a 1D lattice experiment where you make, uh, you basically make a, uh, a cross dipole trap, which are these blue lasers. You put a one dimensional lattice in it. Lattice is just two beams, two lasers with the same frequency counter propagating against each other. Uh, they're both E to the IKX. If you like, you make a standing wave light pattern uh, in space. And that light pattern is a sort of crystal uh, for the atoms. It's like a, a light crystal. Uh, which we call an optical lattice, and they get stored in that lattice in the potential minima. Um, so we did a lot of experiments on that, which I'm not going to show you, but uh, this was the situation towards the end of last year, and this was because we wanted to improve the stability of the experiment. And this experiment's in the C-wing, just, just across the pathway there, where the HVAC is crummy, and I blame the chair of the department for that. <laughs> the chair of the, oh, there, okay, yeah, blame the chair of the department. Um, no, the temperature goes up and down in the lab by many degrees, which is a huge problem for lasers. So we wanted to build a, um, a structure around the experiment, which we got a lot of help with from the machine, uh, from the, uh, the shops here in Jilla. Um, and uh, this is on day zero. You can see there aren't a lot of optics on the table. There's just a little uh, science cell in the middle. Uh, seven days later, you guys probably haven't seen this actually, but seven days later, these guys made a Bose-Einstein condensate, which I think is a Guinness, this must be a world record. It's got up here somewhere. To go from that to BEC in seven days uh, is quite amazing. Um, and in case you didn't notice, this is how we take data in uh, Jilla. In Jilla. <laughs> Katie is up there. There's no one from health and safety here, right? Okay. Um, what it looks like is this. Um, it's, it's not a com super compact experiment, but it certainly would fit within, say, a cubic meter box. Uh, so if you've seen a lot of AMO experiments, you'll, you'll know that they can be rather large, right? Um, with ovens and Zeeman slowers and, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, this device really does fit on just the end of the optical table. Um, it's got the uh, double cell uh, cold quanta system sitting in the middle here. The atoms are actually captured from, uh, they're produced by a dispenser in the bottom cell by just running three amps through a, through a, a piece of uh, metal that, that spews off rubidium, creates a background vapor, and then you create a magneto-optic trap in the bottom, and then there's a push beam which push them up, pushes them up through a differential pumping tube, and then they go into the top chamber, which is this thing up here, where, where all the fun happens. Okay, that's, 
The reason for that is that you want a very high vacuum in the science cell that you're going to do the experiments. And actually, probably the, the lifetime up here is of the order of 100 seconds or so, so it's way longer than anything that we're going to do with the experiment. So basically, there's no atoms up here that's going to degrade it. Um, and on this, um, uh, around this, uh, the other things that are on here, there's the science cell. This top layer here is all of the 3D lattice uh, optics. Um, there's a high power laser here. It's typically a 30 watt, 50 watt laser kind of. Uh, and it's a uh, beam path up here. It's split into three, which go uh, for all the X, Y, and Z Cartesian directions. And each one of those is split into two because in the X direction you need one going this way and one going this way. So there's a total of six beams created up here. Um, the other thing I'll mention as well is that uh, on every one of those six beams is an acousto-optic modulator. And what that does is it modulates a signal with the light beam and it allows you to switch to move slightly the frequency of the light. Um, if you've got a lattice made by two laser beams of the same frequency, the standing wave that they produce is just fixed in space. But if you move one of the frequencies up and the other one down, then the interference pattern starts to translate. Right? You can think about it as if you were on the lattice translating, you would have a Doppler shift that would bring them back into resonance. Okay? So by that little trick, you can move the lattice around. And we have one of these AOMs on every one of these six laser beams. So that's how we play all our fun and games, is by, by doing that. Um, the optical tweezer part that I showed you in the evaporation is created by a cross dipole trap. That's a separate high power laser, which is sitting here on this middle layer. Um, what it looks like is this. Um, this is essentially the whole experiment. As I said, this is just the end of the laser table. There's also a box of other optics in here. There's a main laser. Uh, there's offset locks for uh, uh, repump light and, and uh, imaging light and so on. And that, all, that, uh, all that 780 optics, which is what we use to control rubidium, is piped with an optical fiber into the experiment. So I think you could compact this if you want to like, make a transportable device, which is something that we're thinking about doing in the future. But at the moment, it's set up so that it's easy to play with and control and so on. Um, the 3D lattice configuration. Um, this is, a very, this is a custom cell that we have, um, that we use. You can see here, the lattice is made by all the three Cartesian directions, EYZ, XYZ. The atoms are passed uh, into the same point right in the middle. You can imagine that there's a problem with the z-axis because we have a whole lot of other stuff down here, including iron pumps and things like that, and the other cell which produces the uh, atoms in the first place, which come up through this hole. Um, so inside the cell is a special custom internal optic, which is a little mirror, and it's about four degrees. And so we can pass a laser beam down, hit that mirror, it comes off, um, and misses the cloud. And so by doing that, you can create a beam which goes one way and a beam which goes the other way and make a standing wave of light in the vertical direction. And that gives you access to X, Y, and Z. So that's what, how it works. Uh, I want to emphasize, because you're going to see a lot of these images in a sec, um, that uh, what, what you're looking at is the far field of a diffraction pattern. So imagine that you've got a crystal made of atoms in a, atoms in a periodic array like this. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to drop the atoms. And the atoms have a wave function. And as they expand, the, the wave function of all the different sites start to interfere with each other. And it's very much like light that goes through a diffraction grating. You've got all these little pinpoints. But if you look on the screen in the far field, what you see is something like the Fourier transform of the original light in the diffraction grating. We've got the same thing here. We've got a crystal made of atoms like that, and we're going to drop them and look at the absorption image of a laser from them. And what we're going to see is the diffraction pattern, the far field diffraction pattern. Since these atoms are spaced, the lattice spacing is half a wavelength, it means that in the diffraction pattern, what we're going to see is orders that are the Fourier transform of that. And the inverse of half a wavelength is 2 h bar k. So you'll see a diffraction pattern with orders spaced by 2 h bar k. And that's just giving us a signature of what was originally a periodic crystal. Um, so what happens? Um, if you do this, you build lattices in multiple dimensions. Um, first of all, if we make a one-dimensional lattice by just turning that direction, that dimension on, you can see here the diffraction pattern in the far field. Uh, it's made up of orders. It's, uh, it's got a central peak and 2 h bar k and minus 2 h bar k. Um, for those of you who, that have done solid state physics, you should know that this looks like the uh, block ground state of a periodic sinusoidal potential. Um, so this is basically the lowest energy uh, solution for a periodic lattice. Um, uh, we can do this in 1D. We can shine on two directions, and then you'll see the diffraction pattern in 2D coming out in both directions. 
So you have 0 h bar k plus or minus 2 h bar k in all different directions. And you can also do this in 3D because we have cameras along all the axis. We have four cameras actually uh, imaging the central part of this. And here is the three-dimensional um, uh, diffraction pattern. Uh, and I'm going to mention just while we're here, although this is not the aim of the experiment, but this was a seminal result, I would argue, in AMO um, that we can replicate easily, which is that you can uh, start off with the lattice off and slowly increase the intensity of the three-dimensional three lattice. And what happens is when the lattice is off, you see a Bose-Einstein condensate, but as you start to increase the lattice, you start to see the diffraction pattern. And this is what I've just been talking about. But at some point, it disappears. And what happens in here is called a quantum phase transition. Now, the Hamiltonian actually has a changing order, which at zero temperature is abrupt, and it goes from being a superfluid to an insulating state. An insulating state, all that means is that if you've got atoms in adjacent sites, they, are, they have their little quantum mechanical phase, and the atoms in different sites start to dephase with each other. They lose memory of what phase they are. If you tried to do diffraction through a grating with all sorts of random phases, you don't get anything. You just get a washed out pattern. And that washed out pattern is what's going on here. But I would say for a theorist's point of view, this quantum phase transition is extremely interesting. It's um, not easy to study theoretically. It's got lots of quantum critical behavior, critical coefficients, and all sorts of things. OK, so since we have a lattice, we can move the lattice. We can start to accelerate the lattice. Um, we can do that by changing the frequencies that we apply, uh, the fields that we apply to these acousto-optic modulators. Uh, we can take the lattice, we can start to accelerate it to the left or the right, up, down, in or out. Um, and what this allows us to do is to study a variety of, um, of phenomena. The first one I'm going to show you is kind of also a classic result. Um, it's been thought about for electrons for a long time, but it turns out to be much easier to do with atoms in these crystals of light. Uh, these are called block oscillations, and it's actually reasonably, reasonably easy to understand that these are called band structure pictures for um, uh, lattice physics. And they basically show you what happens at different momenta and different energy, what are the eigen solutions of a, of a lattice problem. Uh, the Bose-Einstein condensate is always formed at the bottom, the lowest energy at zero momentum, so in the bottom of this well. And what happens if you take a quantum particle like this and you try to accelerate is that it starts to move on this diagram. It's called quasi-momentum. It's moving to the left. And as it starts to accelerate like this, it starts to move on this, this lowest curve, it gets to a point where it hits the edge of my diagram. And that point's actually super interesting because the, the momentum is e to the i k x. It's basically a periodic um, wave function. And at that, ver that specific point when it hits the edge of the diagram, the periodicity of that quantum wave function matches the periodicity of the crystal. And when that happens, a very strong interaction happens between the quantum particle and the crystal, and it gets uh, reflected with 100% probability. So basically it wanders up this until it hits this quantum condition and it appears reflected with the opposite momentum. And then it keeps on getting accelerated and it keeps on going round and round in this in cycles. Um, this reflection is called Bragg scattering, which you will have heard of from X-rays as well and other things. Um, and you can see theoretical calculations show this. This is hard to see for electrons just because materials often uh, aren't pure enough. But we see these things beautifully. We accelerate our BEC and we see block oscillations going here. Basically, the atoms disappear on one side and they reappear on the other side and they keep on cycling around. So you try to accelerate a particle, it doesn't go anywhere, it just goes round and round and round in circles, which is a funny quantum effect. I think it's kind of interesting. So people have studied this a lot by dropping BECs in lattices. Uh, in particular, you can use it to measure gravity very accurately. Um, we can do something which I don't think has ever been done before, which is because we can accelerate our lattice in all different dimensions, we can do this block oscillation in one, two, or three directions, dimensions at once, okay? And not only does that allow us then to measure the acceleration, but we can measure the acceleration in two dimensions at once, okay, from a single experiment. And that allows us to do um, what you would call a vector accelerometer. So this is kind of interesting. Um, so this is the 1D block oscillation, but if we apply uh, acceleration in, say, Z and X at once, we can see the atoms undergoing these oscillations in two dimensions at once. And we can plot these oscillations out as a function of time. So we applied here 2G, and then we measured from these fringes that we get what, what values of acceleration we read out from the vector accelerometer, and you can see it agrees well. OK, so that's background. Um, now I want to get a little bit more onto talking about atom interferometry. Okay? So these are kind of the precursor experiments. Um, so what we can do with our, our, our lattice experiment like this is to 
program uh, different components that we can run in the optical lattice that we can cascade together to build different kinds of devices. So it's usually not the case that you do this. Usually you build an experiment, you've got an apparatus, it's fixed, it does something. But here we have this ability to generate a beam splitter through software, okay? Or we can build a mirror through software. So we, it's a bit more like quantum computing where you have a gate set. You have a whole, whole lot of elementary operations and you can glue those things together to program. So we basically use machine learning to do this um, and we can, we can design all sorts of uh, things into the theory. We can make it sensitive to something and not sensitive to something else. Uh, things like that are quite easy to do with the machine learning. And it allows us to build in a single device the p potential to create a variety of actually different kinds of sensors. Accelerometers, multidimensional accelerometers, gyroscopes that measure rotation, uh, gravity gradiometers, or gravimeters that measure gravity, and gravity gradiometers that measure gravity curvature, uh, things like this. Um, and most of these hinge on being able to use our controllable 2D or 3D lattice. So this is, uh, now I'm going to show you some um, data here uh, from the experiment. Um, this here is a Michelson interferometer in 1D. So here is some of the, the things that I talked about as these components. You already saw the beam splitter. That was that crazy thing that I, I mentioned earlier. Um, but if we make a beam splitter, we allow the atoms to propagate. Uh, then we uh, make a mirror, we allow the atoms to propagate, and we ma make a reverse beam splitter. Then we create a path where the atoms uh, enclose an area and they make an accelerometer. And if we look at the absorption images at certain parts in the sequence, you can see the condensate, you can see the atoms divide, you can see the mirror. So this one goes over here and this one goes over here. So they swap places. And we can see that, by the way, by sending them just one way and not the other. And then you can recombine them. And after all this magic, shaking the lattice, doing crazy stuff, you end up with an almost perfect BEC again. So it's magic. All the, all the pathways interfere in such a way that it brings you back to where you started. That's how an uh, interferometer always works. If there's no signal, you should always get back the state you push in, put in. Essentially, that's always, almost always the way you, you create things. It's like an optical interferometer. If the path length differences are the same, the light that comes out is just like the light that goes in. Um, so we can do this, and then we can apply um, our s our signals to it. So here's just a couple of theory uh, slides just to show you. Uh, this is another kind of beam splitter, another kind of mirror, another kind of beam splitter, just to show you there are all sorts of different types. You can see the wave function as a function of time splitting, reflecting, coming back together, and forming the BEC. And if I take this device and I just accelerate it, what you see up here is the resulting scan, the resulting momentum fringes. So when we look at the diffraction pattern, we don't just get like uh, two outputs like a normal interferometer. We get 0 h bar k plus and minus 2 h bar k plus and minus 4 h bar k. We get multiple channels of output. And if you look here, as we vary the acceleration over a pretty small range, you can see here that there are fringes. And it's from those fringes that we have the fingerprint that tells us about the thing we're trying to sense, which is the acceleration. Uh, one more thing uh, in theory. Um, this is something you cannot do with light. You can't take a Michelson interferometer, or so let's say a Mark Zender interferometer, split the photon, and then when they're at the mirror, say, photon, stop. I just want you to sit there, accumulate phase, and then when I bring you back together, you're going to be very sensitive, right? But we can do that with our atoms. We can create a, we can ask the machine to learn a, a um, sequence that takes the split atoms from the conduction band and puts them into the valence band where they basically don't move. They just sit there. And then we can wait, and we can wait, and we can wait, and we can flick a switch, bring them back into the conduction band, bring them together, and have them interfere. And that means that the signal that we generate, which is always pro proportional to the enclosed area, can be as long as you want it, as long as you can maintain coherence of the different parts of the atomic wave function. And you can see up here that the fringes will get more and more rapid, okay? And the more rapid the fringes are, the better the sensitivity that you can make for your uh, sensor. Um, we can do this in 1D, but now let's show you some data from 2D. Um, uh, so, what, what, so this is the beam splitter propagator mirror propagator beam splitter thing again. Um, not only can we do this by moving the lattice in the x direction, but we can also do it in the z direction, and we can do it at once. And what does that mean? If you apply this in two dimensions at once, the way the condensate is going to split in both the x and z directions. So now, instead of the atoms going along two paths, they're going to go along four paths, okay? They're going to be split in both dimensions. They're going to propagate out 
they're going to end up in a, 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 a little square here of separated by plus 4 and minus 4 h bar k and all of the different, the different two dimensions, the mirror is going to send these guys to this corner, these guys to this corner, and so on. It's going to reflect them all. And then when you propagate again, they're all going to come back together, and they're going to form the two-dimensional Bose-Einstein condensate diffraction pattern. So we can do this in 2D. Um, so here is just to sort of reinforce that again. Here you've got the condensate, the beam splitter, and the condensate happening in a 1D lattice. Here you can do the same sort of thing and look at those distributions at these specific times, and you see the original condensate, you see the superposition of going all these four ways at once, and then them coming back and forming the condensate again. It's not perfect, but it's really pretty good, okay? And part of that is to do the f with the fidelity of the machine learning solution. So as time goes on, we might get better at doing this. What I'm showing you here is, um, let me just go back. Uh, we can take this uh, 2D accelerometer now, and we can now apply accelerations to the system in multiple dimensions and form a vector accelerometer, sort of like what I told you about for the block oscillations. Um, so what I'm going to show you now is just to put a sequence of images. So you can just see the fingerprint. Uh, from those images, we're going to try to extract the value of the two-dimensional acceleration. And we're going to go from uh, minus 0.2 g in both x and z to plus 0.2 g in both x and z. So we're going to look at the magnitude of these um, fringes. So as we do this scan, the pattern changes. And by doing really clever analysis of these uh, images on the CCD camera, we can tell. You can see it's going through zero. And then as it starts to go into the positive acceleration, there's a change. So it goes back to negative. And so basically what we need to do is to come up with a good information theoretic way of looking at a 2D diffraction patterns like that. That's like zero acceleration. And now it's accelerating in plus plus. And we want to take these images and basically try to work out what is uh, the acceleration value and with what sensitivity can we measure it. So this is just a picture, um, a graph of what you just saw. There are different points here where you see these little fingerprints. Um, and so what we can do is we can create a calibration, a lookup table. Basically, what do the fringes look like for different accelerations? And then we can look at each uh, value of acceleration that we apply. Uh, we run 10 experiments at each value. We, uh, we consult the lookup table for each of those 10 experiments. We find out what is the maximum likelihood, a solution for the acceleration. And since we do it for multiple um, different runs, we can also form error bars on that reconstruction. So here is the result of that. And you can see us uh, sort of uh, capably measuring the applied uh, two-dimensional acceleration magnitude from this minus point two up to plus point two. There are error bars here but they're pretty small, so it's hard to see. Uh, so it works, okay? So this crazy machine learning, complicated solution done in multiple dimensions gives us this kind of fidelity of, of sensor. Um, if we want to do a vector measurement, we shouldn't just measure the magnitude, we should also measure the angle so that we know which direction the system's accelerating in. And here are the different fingerprints for different polar plots going around the cycle. There are 36 different experiments done between zero and 360 degrees. Uh, we can consult our lookup table for 10 experiments per shot and construct the values as we go around of our best maximum likelihood guess with error bars. And you can sort of see once again that we applied this uh, red acceleration, uh, which is 0.1 g, and we changed the direction of the acceleration all the way around the clock, and then we rediscovered from the data, like what we actually saw. Um, so this is a vector accelerometer, which is a kind of new thing in metrology. I think it's interesting anyway. Um, uh, one other thing I'll mention just briefly is that this problem of a lookup table where you've got a model for the experiment and you're making multiple measurements is intrinsically a Bayesian reconstruction problem. So for those of you who have done this in statistics, you'll recognize what I mean. Um, basically, you've got a whole lot of different images like this and you want to optimally combine all of the data together based on a known model, which is the Ford problem, and construct a posterior distribution. And this is essentially showing you in real time how that reconstruction builds up a probability density for the value of the acceleration, which, which gets better and better and better. And it decreases statistically as the square root of n, which is a sort of known result in statistics. OK, so now some fun pictures. Um, let me show you how sensitive this device is. Um, so we have done, uh, we've picked a certain fingerprint, which is this value down here, um, which corresponds to uh, uh, certain values of acceleration that we apply. 
uh, around about 0.2 G. Uh, and then we can take this um, single uh, applied point and rerun the experiment 200 times. This takes uh, the order of an hour or two, something like that, to collect this sort of data at the moment with the cycle times we have. So it's not a huge amount of uh, data gathering operation yet. Um, and uh, what we see when we try to reconstruct this acceleration is two things. This here, which is a sort of an Allen deviation plot, and this here, which is the value. So if I look here, first of all, at this Allen deviation plot, what we're plotting here is the variance in the reconstructed acceleration in units of g uh, for both of the two different dimensions simultaneously, x and z. Uh, and as we combine those, um, well, first of all, the, the number here is about, you know, in the 10 to the minus, it goes down into the 10 to the minus 4 range. Uh, this didn't have any propagation time. So this is the smallest interferometer ever built. It's like, well, not, maybe not true, but that it's, it's small, okay? It's about, um, the atoms only go like of the order of a wavelength, and the time scale of the interferometer is about 500 microseconds. So this is kind of the worst case scenario. We can, we can think about going millimeter scale and we can think about second times, okay? So as we increase the area, this device will get sensitive fast. Um, but you can see here for this device at averaging down, you can see here on the 200 shots here, we get down into this range. And what we've done here is we've taken uh, uh, different samples, uh, independent experiments for three shots, uh, then for 15 shots, and then for um, 100 shots here, and formed histograms of the reconstructed accelerations to show that these, re these histograms agree, if you like, with the um, calculated uncertainties. Up here is the, um, the values that we are getting, and this is on a, a semi-log plot, so when these numbers look sort of uh, wiggling in equal rate, it basically means that you're exponentially converging on your answer. Um, you can measure not just like one acceler a vector acceleration like that, but you can, you can consider doing this for a variety of different acceleration combinations. They have different fingerprints, but they all average down. So this is like uh, 0 0.02 and 0 0.16 for the different dimensions. This is 0, 0, you can see it's nice and symmetrical. This is 0 0.1, 0 0.05 and 0 0.02, 0 0.1, for example. So a number of different combinations of the two-dimensional acceleration. And then we've taken um, 100 shots at each one of these two things and looked at this thing averaging down. Um, so anyway, that's just an example of a two-dimensional accelerometer working. Um, one thing else I would like to mention is that uh, when you push further forward on this, you start to realize that the kind of accelerations we're talking about here are pretty small. Um, in fact, we see a uh, small shift in the fringes from zero, uh, from what we would expect. And if you actually calculate what that would correspond to in terms of a tilt of the laser table, which is floating, you're talking about something which is only a fraction of a degree. And um, they have to align this lattice to be horizontal by hand. Okay, so you can blame Katie, she's sitting up there, for not making it exactly level to a fraction of a degree. But at some point, this will, this will matter. In fact, you can think of this as a measurement of the tilt of the optical lattice. Okay, so that comes out of this. Okay, so I've only got uh, one more slide here to show you, and then um, I, I hope you have some questions for me. Um, but this is the best plot, so if you fell asleep, wake up. Um, we, uh, we have done this now. Instead of for no propagation time, uh, we've tried various propagation times. This is an example here where the interferometer runs for about 5.3 milliseconds. Uh, the atoms are splitting out now by a large fraction, uh, tens of wavelengths, uh, but not, nothing, nothing like the size of our actual laser beams, okay? So we're nowhere near any kind of uh, fundamental limit in terms of the apparatus, um, although I'll talk more about that just in the summary slide. But um, now what you can see here is that we have the same kind of thing, the acceleration scan, the lookup table, but the numbers are getting real small on this axis down here. Um, so we applied a 0.0008 g acceleration, which is really slow, because the lattice is hardly moving here, okay? But nevertheless, even though uh, in the time scale of the interferometer, it, the lattice hardly moves, it's able to sense it. Um, and if we look, use the lookup table there to pull out what values of acceleration we've got here, there's 100 runs. You see we're now getting down here into those numbers that I was talking about at the very beginning of the talk, you know. So um, I'm not saying we've done this like we, you know, like, you know, this is not flying in space tomorrow. But I think it's, also, it's interesting enough to see that this is a potentially um, useful technology. I mean, the, 
the world of Bragg interferometers and Raman interferometers and atomic interferometry in general is literally decades old. You know, there are people have really developed extremely good techniques for building these things, and they've pushed way beyond what I've shown on the screen today. But this is really a new approach to this whole business, and it's a new kind of technology that has the ability to be flexible. As I said, you can reprogram it to do different things on the fly. Uh, by just changing the programming, we can turn it into a gyroscope, for example. And so it's got a lot of, um, I think it's got a lot of potential advantages. One thing we can make, and this is my last slide, is a, is a gradiometer. So um, the diamond pattern, where the atoms go out and they come back in, is an accelerometer. Um, but what you can do is you can make a double diamond, where you split them, you split them again, and then you have a mirror here, and then you unwind the entire thing, bringing them back together, bringing them back together, and putting them back in the original state. And that makes two, uh, d two diamond patterns that are split. Um, and that, th those two diamond patterns, because of the symmetry of this device, is insensitive to acceleration, but it's sensitive to the next derivative of the gravity, which is the gravity gradiometer. Uh, everybody is much, is, is, you, know, you can build good accelerometers, you can even build good gyros, but people are very, very interested in building uh, good gravity gradiometers. They allow you to detect anomalous changes in the mass. Like, for example, there might be a cave underneath you. I don't know why you would want to do that, but it could happen. Um, but anyway, I'm just, okay. But there, are, there is a lot of interest in doing this sort of thing. Um, so uh, just to finish off then, just a few things about the future. Uh, we really want to push on the accuracy and sensitivity limits for this. Um, one of the issues is uh, atoms collide which is good and bad. They wouldn't evaporatively cool if they didn't collide, but on the other hand, these interactions uh, have to be dealt with in terms of making a, a sensitive uh, device. Uh, strontium is an interesting candidate to think about for future experiments just because it has two isotopes that we could use. Strontium-87 is a fermion. Fermions don't like each other. Um, strontium-88 is a, a, a boson that has basically no uh, cl collisional cross-section. So that's interesting, and um, also thinking about uh, the dimensionality uh, that is, you know, um, uh, putting the atoms into an insulator state where they basically don't co collide. Uh, we could go further in machine design methodology. We've just scratched the surface, I think. Uh, this, this idea of bringing machine learning into physics is extremely powerful. I think it's in the future it's going to appear all throughout physics. So it's not just us in quantum science and quantum design. But absolutely, as we go on, uh, we'll improve this. We already do a lot of fundamental work in CFI, QFI. There's a metrics for deciding on how good sensors are. Um, we could do a lot more experimental pro improvements on imaging. We can't see every atom. We would like to have every atom operating as an individual experiment. We're nowhere near the quantum limit on imaging. Uh, we would like to make the BEC formation process faster. Um, so going forward, uh, one of the big thrusts for us is going to be removing technical noise basically phase locking, intensity, polarization, frequency of the lattice and things like that, and moving this more and more into the direction of a precision measurement experiment. So uh, we're going to be thinking about next designs, about bringing this out of the lab, what would you need to do to build this to make a deployable device that could drive around in a truck, fly in a plane, fly in a satellite. Um, that, that's related to size, weight, and power considerations, uh, improving the short-term and long-term stability of it. And then also thinking about um, the idea of having multiple sensors. Okay, so this one of the advantages is we can all do this with an integrated device, but it would also be interesting to have multiple versions of this experiment. Um, that is, you know, uh, so that we can compare accelerometers, for example, in different places. So there's just a few thoughts. Uh, thank you for your attention. We have time for a few questions. Um, Uh, Adam, and then back to David. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, so um, the, that, that's a very good question, and interactions, I think, are really a big concern in a way. I think um, it's surprising in a way that we've been able to get to the point where we are without being sort of limited by them, I would say. Um, however, we do do spend a lot of time thinking about this. Uh, for the 
case of the mean field, which is that we're, we're looking at the gross Podievsky dynamics, um, all of the machine learning and everything else can be done within that context. So you can actually sort of build that into the learning, uh, learning program. Uh, on the other hand, you can't control everything. So um, I, I, I can't answer the question um, exactly because I think it's almost an experimental question at this point. Like we really need to know uh, what, we, we just keep on averaging down until we find the limit, you know. And one of the limits is going to be interactions, which is going to be density dependent. So we're going to find that. Um, we have thought a bit about uh, splitting the atoms using basically the insulator state so that you get the parity uh, situation where only one atom per site will form. And that gives you some immunity from the collision problem. So there are potential pathways forward, including fermions as well. Um, but so far, um, you know, this is so new, <laughs> Adam. Like, honestly, you know, th 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 oh, I'm showing you things that have only been done in very recent times. So that is basically the, the frontier topic for us going forward. Uh, I think David had a question, then we'll come back to you, Jim. It's not, that's a lie. There's, there's not no intuition. That's not true. Um, it's not an accident, for example, that we go to the state that we do, which is just in the conduction band. Um, that's because you want the atoms to be able to propagate, but you, you also want the atoms to be really close to the top of the lattice. And that's because it's much easier to grab hold of them. If you were to try